Hey there, Mises Math people out there. Today we're going to talk about what I have up here, two sample T intervals. So we're going to look at independent groups. So let's say we're taking two samples and we have two independent samples. We're going to take and find a confidence interval. And with that confidence interval, we need to interpret it. And we're going to um, talk about how we maybe look at a hypothesis test and what do we do when we see a confidence interval and how can that help us determine whether or not there's evidence to support an alternative hypothesis. Now, one thing that you have to know with this is that um, our T star, our degrees of freedom is really kind of difficult to figure out when we're using a two, in the, when we're using two independent samples. So we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to use some technology. So whatever technology you use in my stats class, we use a TI Inspire. You could use a TI um, 83 or an 84 will also work to, to use this T test or a T interval. But bottom line is when you're doing, at least for an AP exam or a statistics class, you're gonna to wanna to show some math work. So you're gonna to wanna to use the formula at least to show that you know these statistics, plug in what you know, and then um, use the cal let the calculator do a lot of the hard work, okay? So let's take a look at how we do this. All right, let me move myself down here. Corner. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is we have got this situation here where we're looking at uh, saturated fat content. And if you hear some banging out on the side there, um, they're working on my house here. So uh, several pizzas sold by two national food chains and these are fat content. So what I have here is I have the formula for a in a uh, ninety five well for a confidence interval for two independent samples and we're looking at the difference in means. So what we're looking at is we're looking for the true difference in the mean saturated fat content. So when we were doing two sample proportions, we did this a very similar thing in that we took the difference of the two proportions. This time, um, this is a, a little bit different formula than what was for our proportions. This is for, of course, for means. So if we looked at our one sample mean, excuse that, let's get rid of that there. Um, one sample mean, we would just have S, you know, it was S over root N. Well, since we're doing um, the sum of or the difference of two, we've got to use kind of like that Pythagorean theorem-ish thing that we talked about a long a while back when we were talking about random variables. Suffice it to say, this is your formula. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we're going to do. So the first thing, of course, we do in any type of inference is we need to exactly, we got to write the conditions. So let's go ahead and write our conditions of inference. Now, here's our conditions. So let's start with our conditions. Now, the great thing about conditions is that the first few are basically the same. So the first one is always that, yes, you guessed it, the sam both samples in this case were taken at random. So let's let's go ahead and, and we don't know if these were randomly selected. Um, it doesn't say, it just says here's some, here's a sample. So we're gonna say, if we don't know that they're randomly selected, um, we're gonna say, we're gonna assume, we're gonna assume both both pizza samples or sample both samples both samples both samples from brand D and brand PJ are representative of all their pizzas all right if we do know that it was randomly selected then we're going to want to say um, both samples were randomly selected one thing you do not want to do is you do not want to just say srs now that's if you're in my class you know that um, we don't even really talk about that but uh, i have been an ap grader and i do see that um, from many students they put srs as their first one and that's not correct we cannot assume that these were taken with a simple random sample we just have to assume that they were taken at random okay number two i'm sorry guys for the banging um, they're working on removing some concrete from my backyard so um, real life guys stats real life right <laughs> okay Number two is that um, each sample, um, each sample is less than 10% of the 
of all pizzas sold at each place. All right, we just want to make sure that we have a small enough sample size. Here's a different one here. Number three is different for this. Okay, both samples are independent. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want one pizza, we don't want any pizzas in both places, right? Um, we can assume that, you know, no pizza came, no pizza came from both stores, came from both restaurants. All right, and it, of course, we always want to put some context in there. So this one's different, right? That one's different than what we've done in the past. We're dealing with independent samples. Now, the fourth one is that we have a nearly, this is the nearly normal condition. Now, I don't know that these come from a normal population. So if I knew that the fat contents of each of the uh, brand D and brand PJ, if I knew that the pizzas came from a, the fat content um, distributions were normal population distributions, then I can just put that. But I don't know that. And I know that here, um, ND is equal to 20. And N um, PJ is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, fifteen, right? So since they're both less than thirty, uh, we're going to need to use the. Uh, we're going to need to actually draw out either a histogram or some sort of plot that's going to show us that they're unimodal and symmetric. So I'm going to go and do a back-to-back uh, -back stem and leaf. It seems appropriate in this case. So let me go and draw this back-to-back -back stem and leaf. All right, so I created a back-to-back uh, -back stem and leaf plot here. And um, notice here that this is uh, fairly unimodal and symmetric. They both kind of are. So we're gonna say since both distributions are fairly unimodal and symmetric, we can use a T distribution. And we'll create a two sample T interval. All right, and we know this based on the central limit theorem. So now that we got our condition satisfied, we're gonna go ahead and use this formula. Now we need the summary statistics for this. We're gonna need our, our standard deviation here. We're gonna need our X bar, and we're gonna need some sort of T star and degrees of freedom. So here's what we're gonna do. In our mechanics, we're basically gonna write in, let's, let's go with um, X D minus X P J plus or minus T star degrees of freedom times the square root of SD squared over ND uh, plus SPJ squared over NPJ. And we're gonna go and just write this stuff in. Now, in order to do that, I need to go to my calculator. So my calculator here, I have put in um, brand D and brand PJ, and I put them in, a, in two lists in a spreadsheet, okay? And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna hit menu, statistics and now to get the the stack calculations i can use one variable statistics but if i just do my confidence interval right away and i'm going to use a two sample t interval it's going to give me all of the things i need to plug into my formula so i'm going to just go ahead and do this right away so two sample t interval now i'm using data i don't have stats but i'm using data so i'm going to say okay my first list is going to be d because i'm subtracting d and pj right so brand pj I don't have a very frequently list, and I do want 95% um, confidence interval. Now, for a T distribution, um, these did come from separate uh, populations, so we're not going to go. We're not going to pull these. Uh, most of the time, you're not going to pull these for for a T interval anyway. Um, let's go and put my results in column D. Hit OK, and now I have all my results. So let's take a look. Um, we have our confidence interval, but we're going to want to put down all of our information here. So X1 is 11.25, so we're going to write that down, 11.25 minus, what do we have, 6.7, 6.714, so 6.714 plus or minus, now I do not think it's going to tell us, it's not going to tell us our T, but it will tell us our degrees of freedom, which is 31.228, so we're just going to write T star 31.228 degrees of freedom. And then we're gonna write down our other stuff here. Our standard deviation was 
3.19 and 2.58. 2.58 squared over 15. Okay, I believe that's what I have. Oh, it's 14. 14. 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oops. I must have missed a number somewhere. Let me go check what I missed here. Okay, y'all, I just checked. It looks like I missed a four. So I changed my uh, mean and it changed my standard deviation just a tad. So you can go and change those in there. And so that's all the work we're going to show. And then we're going to go ahead and have our confidence interval. So our upper is going to be 6.7. So we're going to go ahead and say 6.71. And our lower is 2.7. We're going to go and say 2.73. All right. So now what does this mean? Because we always have to interpret this guy, right? Interpret. So how do we interpret this? Well, we're looking at the difference in means of dominoes and, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to say dominoes. D and PJ. Brand D and brand PJ. So here's what we're going to say. We are 95% confident. that the mean, now we gotta compare these. We can't just say the true difference in means. I want you comparing using context, okay? So we are 95% confident that the mean um, fat content in brand PJ pizza, oh, uh, brand D pizza, sorry, that was first, right? D came first is between 6.71 grams and 2.73 grams higher why did i say higher higher because they're both positive than brand pj so what does this tell me this tells me that that brand p brand d is always going to be bigger than brand pj because they're both positive so if I was looking at an alternative hypothesis of whether um, uh, mu, mu of D was not equal to mu of PJ or a, a null hypothesis that they were equal. Okay, actually, let me say this is greater than, right? Since, since our interval is always greater than and we're 95% percent um, confident that brand D is between 6.7 and 22.73 grams higher on average, right, than PJ, that would be enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Now, when would it not be enough evidence to support the null hypothesis? And we would fail to reject the alternative. Or wait, I said that the wrong way. I'm sorry. When would it not be enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis? And then we would fail to reject the null. Well, that happens if the um, if the interval goes from negative to positive or positive from negative, because that means zero is in the interval, which would tell us that, well, you know what? It could be that there is no difference between the two. Okay, so that's how we relate a confidence interval in two sample, for two samples, independent groups of means to our hypothesis. All right, so what I've shown you today is I showed you how to find the conditions for independent samples, how to calculate your um, confidence interval and how to interpret your confidence interval. Remember, you're going to need a calculator to do this because the degrees of freedom aren't found through uh, just through algebra or whatever, or even just you know n minus one or n minus two. That doesn't work for these. You're going to have to use a calculator. All right. We'll see you soon, guys. Talk to you later. Bye.